Hi, and welcome back to the third data analysis lecture. I trust you're having fun thus far. Okay, so today we're going to explore quantitative techniques and test just a little bit more. There are generally two different levels of statistical analysis. That is descriptive and inferential. Descriptive statistics tends to organize and summarize data. Why? So that we can comprehend the data of interest in an easily comprehensible manner. Inferential statistics tends to infer from a sample of the population of interest those characteristics of interest. Why? Well, can you imagine having to collect information from the whole population in order to draw conclusions? This would be near impossible. So basically, statistics has derived a means for drawing a sample in such a way and using certain statistical methods in order to be able to generalize to that population conclusions based on that very manageable sample. Right, so let's start with some useful data summary techniques. Basically, data can be summarized by looking at three things. The first is the shape of the distribution. The second is the center of the distribution, or otherwise known as the central tendency. And then the third manner is by looking at the spread of data. All right, so I mentioned, first of all, the shape of the distribution. Okay, now the shape of distributions in statistics is very important. It is this very symmetrical bell-shaped curve that looks a little like this that underlies a lot of our parametric tests. This distribution is known as the normal distribution, and it allows us to make inferences about the population based on our sample. Basically, the shape of the distribution is important and can be defined primarily by looking at two things, the skewness and the kurtosis. Skewness indicates where the bulk of your distribution of counts lie or your frequencies, whereas the kurtosis indicates the degree to which the scores cluster at the end, ends of the distribution. The ends of your distribution are known as your tails. Your kurtosis also indicates how pointy the distribution is. A normal distribution will have values of zero for both the skewness and kurtosis. The second manner in which we summarize data is by looking at the center or the middle of the distribution. It's most commonly measured using what is known as the mean, the median, or the mode. Again, our level of measurement of data determines the type of measure of central tendency that we will use. The mode is most commonly used for nominal data and basically refers to the most frequently occurring score. The median is most often used for ordinal level of measurement and possibly interval level data and denotes the process by which we sort all of our data from the lowest to the highest numbers and then literally find the middle score. Lastly, we have the mean, and this tends to be used mostly with ratio level data, whereby we add all the scores together and then divide by the total number of scores in that data set. The third manner in which we summarize data is by looking at the spread or the dispersion of the scores around the center or the middle of the distribution. This can be mainly done by looking at the range the interquartile range, standard deviation, and variance. Most popular of these is the standard deviation, or the units that a particular score falls away from that mean. So this brings me to some of the methods we use to assess central location, shape and spread of the data, and introduces descriptive statistics known as the frequency distribution, now, frequency tables deal with how many times a particular score occurs. It becomes a frequency graph or distribution when we plot these counts, with observations on the horizontal axis and the frequency or the count on the vertical axis. Frequency distributions such as these allow us to determine the shape, 
the spread and the centra, central location of our data set regarding that particular variable or question. In addition, and given its shape, frequency distributions allow us to estimate probability or the likelihood that something will occur. For example, if we were to plot the average IQ for US citizens, and this is a true story, folks, it equals 100 with a standard deviation of 15 either way. This means that most people will have an IQ of between 85 and 115. What if I said to you, what is the probability that South Africa's petrol price will drop down to 3 Rand 99 per litre next month? Very low, isn't it? Near impossible, perhaps. How did we know this? Because we have something to compare it to. In the same way, we can look at the frequency which with, with which something occurs and use that to estimate the probability with which something will occur. So we look at that person or that measure and its position in relation to the rest of the scores. These types of frequency distributions have been modified mathematically to form an idealized distribution known as a probability distribution, which makes it possible to calculate the probability of getting particular scores based on frequencies with which a particular score occurs. So when we collect data to test our theories, we are basically implying that the probability of obtaining a particular set of data if, hypothetically speaking, the null hypothesis was true. Right, if we move away from descriptives or the summarizing of data as a whole to say something general about the world, we use what are known as inferential statistics. Inferential statistics tell us whether the alternate hypothesis is likely to be true. They help us to confirm or reject our predictions. Crudely put, we fit a statistical model to our data that represents the alternative hypothesis to see how well it fits in terms of the variance it explains. If it fits the data well, in other words, it explains a lot of the variation in the scores, then we assume that our initial prediction is true. We gain confidence in the alternative hypothesis. Of course, we can never really be completely sure that either hypothesis is correct. And so we calculate the probability that our model will fit if there were no effects in the population. In other words, the null hypothesis is true. As this probability decreases, we, great, we gain greater confidence that the alternative hypothesis is actually correct and that the null hypothesis can be rejected. This works provided we make our predictions before we collect the data. We then need to present continuous interval and ratio level data. It's more preferable to use histograms in these instances than frequency graphs or distributions. Line charts are particular types of bar charts, but with lines instead of bars. We use this option when you just want to see the means of scores across different groups of cases, or where we want to plot the means of a particular variable um, over time, it tends to be. Right. A scatter plot is simply a graph that plots each person's score on a variable against their score to other variables. A scatter plot tells us several things about data, such as whether there seems to be a relationship between the variables, what kind of relationship it is, and whether any cases are markedly different from other cases. Basically, when we talk about inferential statistics, we're looking at tests such as ANOVA, Kruskal Wallace, t-tests, uh, Man Whitney and so forth and we need to check and when we need to check for differences we look for uh, tests such as chi-square which um, chi-square on the other hand which test for associations an example of differences here would be is there a significant difference in the number of headaches between people who take panado and people taking sugar sweets as a placebo these tests all deal with individual scores. 
However, we also have instances where we have paired data. For instance, the numbers of cups of coffee and the level of alertness. These types of data and the strength and direction of the relationship between the variables is measured more formally than scatter plots through what are known as correlations and regressions. And with continuous interval ratio normally distributed data, we use the Pearson's correlation coefficient. However, where the data is categorical, um, this is usually an instance of ordinal and nominal level data, we use Spearman's row. Now regression not only shows us the general trend between the variables, but also allows us to make predictions using what is known as the line of best fit or the regression line. Again, regression requires that certain assumptions be met in order for output to be accurate. So there are multiple tests and assumptions available to you when you are at that point where you are analyzing your data. You will need to pay due cognizance of these requirements to provide accurate and relevant output. And you need to consider these factors when designing your data collection instrument. If you're doing a study that requires ANOVA, don't collect nominal and ordinal level data. Don't use closed-ended Likert scale type questions as you will not be able to run an ANOVA. Furthermore, and as mentioned in previous video lectures, you will need to dovetail all of your findings with the literature. Remember, quantitative analysis about, is about testing theories. Well, you need to mention how your findings support or refute these existing theories and then discuss it accordingly. Just presenting statistics is not analyzing them. It's the presentation and discussion thereof that constitutes an analysis. In addition, never be afraid of admitting to having done something wrong. If your sample size was, for example, too small, don't be afraid to admit it. You cannot critique a person who has already admitted to the shortcomings of their study. So, in addition, statistics is a largely cumulative subject. So once you start learning about statistics and reading about it and how to conduct quantitative analyses, don't stop. It's a skill that you, as future managers and decision makers, will use for the betterment of resource utilization, project management, implementation, monitoring and evaluation and so forth. Perhaps one day you too could be making your own video lectures. In the next video, I will proffer up an introduction and a brief overview of 